Jacksonian Democracy, 1828 to 1840. This lecture focuses on the controversies in Jackson's presidency and the emergence of a new party system. It narrates and explains his Indian policy, the nullification controversy, and the Bank War. The rivalry between Jackson and John C. Calhoun is also outlined, as is the growing gulf between supporters of federal rights and those of states' rights. The lecture goes on to discuss Jackson's rivalry with Nicholas Biddle over the Bank of the United States, also known as the BUS, and the formation of the Whig Party to replace the National Republicans. Jackson's political philosophy and his position regarding the dramatic expansion of democracy are also treated in an attempt to illustrate the catalytic nature of his presidency. The lecture concludes by relating Jackson's economic policies to the coming crisis that would cripple Martin Van Buren's aspirations for a successful presidency. The Panic of 1837 and its impact in the 1840 election are also considered. Jacksonian Democracy Politics became a popular form of entertainment. Alexis de Tocqueville observed that politics was the only pleasure an American knows. Jackson was openly partisan and politically involved, unlike previous presidents, and he sought voters among the people, lobby, Congress, and formed hickory clubs to campaign for Jackson. He also benefited from his new powerful democratic machine run by Martin Van Buren of New York. Jackson emphasized and benefited from the trend towards democratization. During the 1820s and 1830s, the right to vote among white males increased as many states lowered or eliminated property requirements. As more men gained suffrage, Jackson and his supporters appealed to voters, and during political campaigns and through the use of slogans, picnics, parades, and other forms of mass entertainment. While democratization during this period expanded, suffrage in political participants for white males, notably some free blacks in the northern states, Many groups were excluded. The emphasis on the common man and majority rule marginalized minority voices, including those of women, Native Americans, and free blacks in the South. There was also the driving anti-democratic forces. Southern slaveholders believed that the surge of democratic activism would threaten the slave system itself. Jacksonian Democrats helped expand economic opportunity and political participation for working men, such as white factory laborers, craftsmen and mechanics, small farmers, and land-hungry frontiersmen. Jackson had promised to protect the poor and the humble from the tyranny of wealth and power. Democracy Unleashed in Jackson's inaugural address, Jackson gave a brief speech in which he committed his administration to the task of reform in the federal government, taking jobs out of the unfaithful or incompetent hands and balancing states' rights with the oaths of the exercise of national power. He also pledged to preserve and uh, pursue the will of the people and a just and liberal Indian policy. Western frontiersmen mingled with Washington society at the inaugural ball, signaling the arrival of the common people at political power. In this depiction of Andrew Jackson's inaugural party, satirist Robert Krushak draws a virtual parallel to Noah's Ark, uh, suggesting that the people from all walks of life were now welcome in the White House, then called the Executive Mansion. But it got so wild and crazy that the White House interior was almost destroyed. Since that inaugural, Americans have not been invited back to the White House during the inaugural. Jackson as president, to the victor belong the spoils. Jackson believed that it was best to have politicians serve in every branch of office instead of career bureaucrats. That way, the new administration was elected, those appointed in the previous team would return to their previous occupation. In addition, such a spoiled system allowed him to appoint his political supporters to offices. Although this was his plan, he replaced only 20% of the entire bureaucracy during his term of office. Jackson was unaccustomed to the political infighting in Washington, D.C., soon found himself entwined in the political war between his vice president, John C. Calhoun, and Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren. 
the Eaton Affair. The split in the cabinet between Calhoun supporters and Van Buren supporters was magnified in a Washington social feud involving barmaid Peggy O'Neill, who in 1829 had become the second wife of Secretary of War John H. Eaton. Peggy Eaton had married John Eaton only three months after her first husband committed suicide. Since Jackson's wife, Rachel, had died, Forde Calhoun was the highest ranking woman in the social circles in Washington, D.C., and other cabinet wives refused to receive her to, due to her unsavory past. This led others to follow suit. Van Buren used this riff to grow closer to Jackson. When the issue was raised in a cabinet meeting, the only one to support Peggy Eaton besides the president was the widower Martin Van Buren. Van Buren resigned in order to participate in the cabinet reorganization, and Eaton also offered his resignation as well, both of which were accepted by Jackson. Jackson then asked for the resignation of the Treasury Secretary, Secretary of the Navy, and the Attorney General, all who gave their resignations. Jackson appointed Van Buren minister to England, and although the Senate rejected it, his critics believed that it would end his career, and Eaton, governor of Florida. The cabinet was reorganized to promote harmony, leaving only Postmaster General William T. Berry from the original cabinet. A bill pushed through Congress to build a 60-mile road in the state of Kentucky by Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun. Jackson embarked on a campaign against internal improvements that only benefited a particular state. Most famously, he vetoed the Maysville Road Bill in 1830, which would use federal money to build a road from Maysville to Lexington, entirely located in the state of Kentucky. He argued that the interstate and trust state within a state internal improvements should be funded only by the states, and that the Constitution gave the federal government authority over only interstate between the states' commerce. He continued funding interstate projects. Opponents considered that Jackson's veto of the Maysville Road Bill an abuse of power. The Eastern Indians. As the population of the United States continue to expand and grow, Native Americans continue to find themselves pushed from one area to another, while treaties forbidding such actions were dismissed. Native Americans held land east of the Mississippi River that white men wanted, especially in the South where the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminoles controlled large areas. Jackson believed that moving the Indians would serve their best interests as well as the national interests for the states in the Lower South, especially the Carolinas, Georgia. And in Alabama, Jackson also believed that this was a wise and humane policy that would save them from utter annihilation. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, which swapped land that the Indians were currently inhabiting for federal land west of the Mississippi River. At this point, very few tribes were able to resist. The federal government promised that they would pay for the moving of Native Americans to their land in Oklahoma. Indian leaders were skeptical of Jackson's proposals and also provoked opposition from reformers. He just trusted him. Even his friend Davy Crockett opposed the forced removal in the May of 1830. The Senate did pass the Indian Removal Act only by a single vote. Resistance to Black Hawk War was led by Black Hawk, a Sauk leader. The war erupted soon after the Black Hawks and a group of Sauks, Mesokalis, and Kickapoos, known as the British Van, crossed the Mississippi River into the United States state of Illinois from Iowa Indian Territory in April 1832. U.S. officials convinced that the British band was hostile, mobilized the frontier militia, and opened fire on the delegation from the Native Americans on May 14, 1832. Black Hawks responded by successfully attacking the militia at the Battle of Stillman's Run, 
he led his band to a secure location in what is now southern Wisconsin and was pursued by U.S. forces commanded by General Henry Atkinson. The U.S. troops tracked the British band militia under Colonel Henry Dodge, caught up with the British band on July 21st, and defeated them at the Battle of Wisconsin Heights. Black Hawk's band was weakened by hunger, death, and desertion, and many Native survivors retreated towards the Mississippi. On August 2nd, U.S. soldiers attacked the remnants of the British band at the Battle of Bad Axe, killing many of the, or in capturing most, who remained alive. Black Hawk and other leaders escaped, but later surrendered and were imprisoned for a year. The Black Hawk War gave the young Captain Abraham Lincoln his brief military service, although he never participated in a battle. Other participants who later became famous included Winfield Scott, Zachary Taylor, and Jefferson Davis. The war gave impetus of the U.S. policy of Indian removal, in which Native American tribes were pressured to sell their lands and move west of the Mississippi River and stay there. The Second Seminole War the Treaty of Payne's Landing in 1832 with various Seminole leaders, it called for the Seminoles to move within three years to the land assigned to the Creek Indians west of the Mississippi. The Seminole leaders found the land to be suitable and the Seminoles to be absorbed by the Creeks. It also required that African Americans living on the Seminole Reservation be left behind so that they could be claimed as slaves. A delegation of Seminoles went to the Creek lands and finding them acceptable. In 1833, they were coerced into signing the Treaty of Fort Gibson, which affirmed the terms of the earlier treaty. The Seminoles subsequently denied that they had agreed to being removed. General Wiley Thompson was assigned to oversee the removal of the Seminoles in 1834. After learning that they did not intend to leave Florida, he informed the Seminoles that President Jackson had authorized him to remove them by force if necessary. Chief Osceola would emerge as a leader among the Seminoles determined to resist resettlement. The Dade Massacre on December 28, 1835, as Fran Major Francis Dade was leading more than 100 soldiers from Fort Brook near Tampa, to Fort King near present-day Ocala. Some 180 Seminoles and their allies ambushed the troops, killing all but three. The Dade Massacre marked the start of the Second Seminole War. That same day, Osceola also killed Thompson. And on December 31st, another contingent of some 750 soldiers and volunteers led by General Duncan Clinch was ambushed on the Withalachi River and forced to withdraw. General Thomas Jessup. Throughout 1836, Seminoles attacked plantations, outposts, and supply lines, and they had stymied several efforts by the United States to subdue them. Near the end of the year, however, General T Thomas Jessup took charge of the U.S. forces, and he instituted a change in strategy, sending small contingents of men to pursue Seminole bands. The tide subsequently began to turn. In October 1837, Jessup set up a false truce and captured Osceola, a dozen of his followers. In December, Colonel Zachary Taylor led some 1,000 men against a reported Seminole encampment at Lake Okeechobee. In the ensuing battle, the badly outnumbered Seminoles imposed heavy losses but were nonetheless forced to withdraw. The final major engagement, the Battle of Lokahatchee River, took place in January of 1838. A contingent of sailors and soldiers led by Lieutenant Levin Powell encountered a large group of Seminoles and was forced to retreat. A few days later, Jessup dispatched some 1,500 men to engage the Seminoles, who fought valiantly but were defeated. Over the next four years, small engagements continued to take place, and an increasing number of Seminoles were induced or forced to move west to the Creek Reservation. By 1842, some 3,000 to 4,000 Seminoles had been resettled, and only a few hundred remained. The Armed Occupation Act of 1842 promoted white settlement in Florida, and the Second Seminole War was declared over on August 14, 1842, although no treaty was ever signed.
The fix policy of the Jackson administration and pressure from the states forced Native Americans in the 1830s to migrate from their eastern homelands to a special Indian reserve west of the Mississippi River, which is the Oklahoma Territory, which would be named henceforth Indian Territory. Under a series of treaties beginning in 791, the Cherokees in Georgia were recognized as a separate nation with their own laws and customs. White settlement on their lands in Georgia and on neighboring creek lands and encroachment on Choctaw and Chickasaw lands in Mississippi and Alabama created tensions. When gold was discovered on Cherokee lands, the Georgia legislature in 1830 voided the previous laws for which the Cherokees sought relief from the courts. In 1828, the Georgia state legislature placed the Cherokees under state jurisdiction, denying the Native Americans legal rights. In the Supreme Court case, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, Chief Justice John Marshall ruled that the Cherokees had an unquestionable right to maintain control of their ancestral lands, but the court ruled that it lacked jurisdiction. The Cherokees were, after all, a domestic dependent nation, not a foreign state. In Worcester v. Georgia, Georgia officials arrested a group of white Christian missionaries who were living among the Cherokees, a violation of state law. To the missionaries, Samuel Worcester and Leo Butler were sentenced to four years of hard labor. They appealed to the Supreme Court. Marshall ruled that the missionaries must be released and the laws passed by the Georgia legislature violated the constitutional laws and treaties of the United States. President Jackson refused to enforce the court's decision. Jackson supported Georgia, stating, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Now the court ruled that the national government had exclusive jurisdiction over Cherokee territory, a decision defied by Georgia. Southern states will interpret Jackson's reaction and be in a favor of states' rights over national government. We're going to see that's going to be a mistake. Trail of Tears. The Cherokees of Georgia were required to move out west after Elias Mundo and a small faction of the Cherokee Nation signed the Treaty of New Echota. It had been rejected by the Cherokee Nation's official leadership and 90% of the Cherokee people. While many Cherokee elites fought against Jackson's policy. Elias Bunno, editor of the first Native American newspaper, Cherokee Phoenix, signed the Indian Removal Treaty in 1835. He was subsequently murdered. For the Cherokees, the Trail of Tears stretched 1,200 miles from their homeland to the east to what became Indian Territory in Oklahoma. 17,000 Cherokees were evicted. 4,000 died on the nightmarish march from Georgia to Oklahoma after being forced from their native lands. A few Cherokees held out in the mountains in North Carolina. They would be known as the Eastern Band of Cherokees. Several years later, the Creeks and the Chickasaws would march on the same trail. All told, some 100,000 Eastern Indians relocated to the West in the 1820s and the 1830s. The government then sold 100 million acres of Indian land, which was mostly used to grow uh, cotton in the states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. The Bank War. The second bank of the United States. Only 20% of the bank capital was owned by the federal government. The rest was a private corporation with extensive power. The bank held all the federal funds, including tax collections and tariffs, in exchange for an annual $1.5 million fee. The bank was also allowed to use the government's deposits for loans to businesses. It was supported by 29 branches across the nation, and the headquarters were at Philadelphia. And the bank promoted the stable money supply and required the 464 state banks to keep enough gold and silver coins called specie in their vaults in order to pay back their own paper currency. The bank was led by Nicholas Biddle, and the bank had accumulated massive amounts of money and economic clout. Those in the South and the West feared its growing monopolistic power. Jackson, like typical Westerners, had always hated banks whom he called vapas and thieves. His own prejudices came from his own personal financial loss in the 1790s. 
Jackson distrusted banks because they printed too much paper money, causing a rise in inflation. He only wanted gold and silver coins to be used for economic transaction, which is called specie. The bank war between Jackson and Biddle revealed the president never truly understood the bank's role or policies. And the BUS, the Bank of the United States, provided stable monetary system for an expanded economy as well as a mechanism for controlling the pace of economic growth to regulation. An effort to make the recharter of the BUS an election issue, the bank supported and urged that it be readopted in 1832 instead of 1836 when the charter was due to expire. This was led by Henry Clay of Kentucky, believing Jackson would not dare veto the recharting efforts and make it a campaign issue in 1832 and cost him the election. Jackson surprised the supporters by vetoing the bill, and Congress did not have the votes to override it. Jackson's effort to defeat the recharter of the Bank of the United States is likened to fighting a hydra, a many-headed serpent from Greek mythology, just as the hydra would sprout two heads when one was severed. For each bus supporter that Jackson subdued, even more emerged to take his place. Jackson believed that the only acceptable format of money was in hard currency, not paper, which depended on the whim of the bankers, which could be made worthless. He was joined in opposition opposing the bus by many state and local banks, which by law were forced to control their paper currency more than they would like. Nullification John C. Calhoun, state of South Carolina, had suffered an economic malaise due to its inhabitants' thought to the protective tariff on goods imported from Europe. South Carolinians labeled the tariff of abominations. By taxing British cloth coming into U.S. markets, southern cotton growers by reducing British demand. It also hurt southerners by raising the price for imported products. The approval of the tariff of 1828 caused Calhoun to support the theory of nullification. That is, the ability of a state to declare null and void an act of Congress that it did not like, similar to what Jefferson and Madison did with the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. He outlined his views on nullification in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest in 1828. Calhoun claimed at a church in 1828 that he had favored the interest of New England textile manufacturers over Southern agriculture. Due to the circumstances the state could nullify or veto federal law, it deemed unconstitutional. The Clash of Titans, Webster versus Hayne. Since the founding of the colonies, a north-south divide had existed. The western Hain debate sharpened that edge and put the United States on a path to civil war. When the Foot Resolution was introduced to restrict federal land sales in the West, Daniel Webster and Robert Hain engaged in a debate over the theory of nullification and the state's rights to do so. Although the debate began as a discussion of the restriction of federal land sales, it quickly grew to include larger topics concerning states' rights versus federal authority and interest. Daniel Webster's passionate defense of federal authority and national rhetoric helped convince many in the nation that the idea of union was worth supporting. The controversy over the tariff and the nature of the union reached the floor in Congress in 1830. Senator Hayne of South Carolina presented the state's rights argument in a debate with Webster of Massachusetts, advocating strict constructionism and states' rights views over federal interference. Hayne stated that the very life of the system is the independence of the states and that there is no evil more to be depreciated than the consolidation of this government. Webster said one of the greatest speeches given in the Senate chamber the Constitution was created by the people, not the states. The only agency for interpretation of the Constitution is the Supreme Court. No state may declare a federal law null and void and secede from the Union, or the idea of Union would be absurd, no stronger than a rope of sand. Webster concluded, liberty and Union, now and forever, one and inseparable. Hayes countered that the federal government was a compact between the states and that each party was the rightful judge 
of infringement upon its rights. The questions of sovereignty are not subject to judicial consideration. The right of a state's inter interposition is as full and complete as it was before the Constitution was formed. Webster countered that the Constitution was not a compact, but established of a popular government with a distribution of powers binding upon the national government and the states. In the end, Webster had the better argument, and this pleased President Jackson. Calhoun versus Jackson. During his first term, Jackson was beset by dissension with his administration. Here, public confidence is the stability of this administration is toppling. At the Jefferson Day Dinner on April 13, 1830, arranged by Benton and Hayne to align Democrats with Jeffersonian principles and to signify the alliance between the West and the South, numerous toasts alluded to the property of state sovereignty and nullification. Jackson well phrased toast stated our union it must be preserved later amended when printed to read our federal union John C Calhoun responded the union next to our liberty must dear may we always remember that it can only be preserved by distributing equally the benefits and burdens of the union this exchange illustrated the growing differences between Jackson and Calhoun Calhoun's 1818 anti-Jackson action surfaced. Jackson learned in 1830 that Calhoun, when Secretary of War in 1818, had supported measures to punish Jackson for his actions in the Florida Seminole Campaign. Persons hoping to discredit Calhoun informed Jackson of his charge. When Jackson asked Calhoun for an explanation, he was not satisfied by it. Calhoun published a pamphlet containing the correspondence of the Seminole Affair, which angered Jackson, and this completed the rift between them. Jackson began to support Martin Van Buren as his successor to the presidency. In the cabinet coup d'etat, Van Buren had resigned in order to participate in a cabinet reorganization when Eaton offered his resignation as both were accepted by Jackson. Jackson then asked the resignation of Treasury Secretary, Secretary of Navy, and Attorney General, all who gave up their resignations. Cabinets. Martin Van Buren gained favor with Jackson by offering to resign his position, which allowed Jackson to force the rest of his cabinet to resign. Jackson then appointed a new cabinet by the end of August of 1831. Van Buren and other non-cabinet friends and supporters who Jackson trusted became some of his most trusted advisors. Critics dubbed this group Jackson's Kitchen Cabinet, which included Amos Kendall, Isaac Hill, William B. Lewis, Andrew J. Donaldson, and Duff Green. After the cabinet was reorganized in 1831, Jackson relied on it for counsel. The threat of Calhoun the cabinet convinced Jackson to drop his pledge of one term. They believed that Van Buren would not be able to win the nomination in the election, and to, not to do so, John C. Calhoun would do everything in his power to prevent it. The Anti-Masonic Party The Masons, as an all-male social organization, would grow to 2,000 Masonic lodges by 1830 and scattered across the United States were the 100,000 members called Masons or Freemasons, which included Andrew Jackson and Henry Clay. The new anti-Masonic party owed its origins to William Morgan, who had been thrown out of the Masons. When William Morgan mysteriously disappeared after preparing an expose of Freemasonry, an investigation did not solve the mystery of his disappearance but revealed that most New York office holders were Masons. Opponents of Jackson's, also a Mason, exploited the subsequent popular reaction against Freemasonry to form an anti-Jackson political party. Supporters came from New England and New York. This is the first third party in the United States with a national base of support. The first political party to hold a national convention and nominate a candidate for president and the first to have a national platform. The party declined after 1836 and would be absorbed by the Whig Party. The election of 1832.
Democrats, as they were now formally called, in Baltimore renominated Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren for vice president. But Southerners forced the adoption of a two thirds rule. Nominees had to have two thirds of the delegate vote before receiving the nomination. National Republican Convention in Baltimore nominated Henry Clay for president and John Sargent of Pennsylvania for vice president. The anti Masons also met in Baltimore. An antipathy to secret societies spread to other states. A national convention of anti Masons nominated William Wirt of Maryland for president and Amos L. Maker of Pennsylvania for vice president. It was the first third party in the U.S. and the first to hold the national convention, as said before. During the campaign, the primary issue was the Bank of the United States, with Biddle campaigning hard for Henry Clay. The National Republicans were identified with conservative interests. Western agrarian and frontier interests sided with Jackson, as well as Easterners who did not like privileged corporations. Jackson's critics dubbed him King Andrew I. The results, Jackson won 16 of 24 states with 219 electoral votes and almost 700,000 in the popular vote. Clay had 49 electoral votes and almost 530,000 popular votes, and work carried Vermont with seven electors. South Carolina electors went to John Floyd of Virginia and Henry Lee of Massachusetts. Van Buren received 189 electoral votes, although Pennsylvania's electors cast 30 votes for Senator William Wilkins, a favorite son. The Nullification Crisis Although both Jackson and Calhoun were slaveholders, a rift developed between the two on the issue of nullification and the role of the federal government, and Calhoun resigned from vice presidency to take a seat in the Senate representing South Carolina. Calhoun's theory, during 1830-1831, nullification forces gained strength in South Carolina, although Union settlement could not be overcome. Calhoun's Fort Hill address in July of 1831 contained the principle of a concurrent majority. His letter to the governor affirmed that nullification was constitutional, conservative, and a legitimate means of redressing acts deemed harmful to the state. His theory was based on false assumptions about the Constitution. Although Calhoun thought he was following the arguments laid out in the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions of 1798-1799, sovereignty lay in the people of the states, not in the people of the Union. South Carolina nullifiers. Governor James Hamilton Jr. called for a special session of the South Carolina legislature, which authorized a convention which met in Columbia in November. South Carolina Ordinance of Nullification. The convention adopted a court ordinance by a vote of 136 to 26, nullifying the tariffs of 1828 and 1832. The ordinance prohibited the collection of duties within the states effective 1 February 1833 and required a test oath for all state office holders except legislatures and forbade appeals to the Supreme Court of any case in law or equity arising from the ordinance, asserting that the use of federal force was grounds for secession and the state legislature appropriated funds for a state military force. Jackson's response to nullification. Jackson was personally furious, unwilling to accept South Carolina's position in the crisis. Jackson proclaimed that such a policy was treasonous and informed the people of the rebellious state that he would ensure that the tariffs will be collected. He ordered the Secretary of War to alert the forts in Charleston Harbor and Major General Winfield Scott was given command of Army forces in South Carolina. Jackson's December message to Congress recommended a reduction of the tariff, and Jackson issued his proclamation to the people of South Carolina among his most important state papers. Jackson was an impractical absurdity. Nullification, excuse me, was an impractical absurdity. The sovereign and the visible, indivisible federal government was supreme, and no state could refuse to obey the laws of the land or leave the Union. And this union by armed force is treasonous. Henry Clay will step in. When Robert Y. Hayne was elected governor, John C. Calhoun was elected senator in his place and therefore resigned the vice president. See, the first to do so. 
A counter-proclamation called for a general convention of states to consider relations between the federal and state governments, but many states condemned nullification and secession. In January of 1833, Jackson asked Congress for authorization to enforce military and revenue laws in the force bill, if needed. Jackson personally threatened John C. Calhoun, claiming, I'll go down there and hang him as high as Haman. Finally, a compromise tariff would be formed. While Calhoun debated Webster on nationalism and states' rights, South Carolina found itself alone against the might of the federal government. No other state had joined with the nullification plan. Henry Clay helped end the crisis with a proposal to gradually reduce the tariff rates until 1842. This gave South Carolina the opportunity to escape its dilemma by saving face while also backing down. The War Over the Bus Jackson interpreted his election as a popular mandate to proceed against the Bank of the United States and started removing federal funds, depositing them in select state banks beginning in October, using 23 state banks first called pet banks and by the end of 1833. Jackson justified his actions in his annual message to Congress, and he claimed complete responsibility for removing the deposits on the grounds that the bank had tried to influence elections. Biddle's response, he ordered the bus to quit making loans and demanded that the state banks exchange a paper currency for gold and silver coins. Biddle was trying to create a depression in order to show the importance of the bus. Jackson responded with, He's trying to kill me, but I will kill it. Biddle's plan worked. Clay and Calhoun argued that Jackson's halting all federal government payments into the bank and spent the remaining funds that it had on deposit was illegal. Jackson transferred the federal funds to the so-called pet banks, 23 state banks, mostly in the West. The New Whig Party in 1834, the anti-Jacksonians started calling themselves Whigs, a name associated with 18th century American and British opposition to tyranny. Congressional reaction to Jackson's actions against the bank led to the founding of the Whig Party. The first members of the Whig Party believed that Jackson had exercised too much power in his years as president. Local and state coalitions of the Whigs elected a majority to the House of Representatives in 1835. Whigs viewed government as a force to promote economic development, and compared to Democrats, Whigs were more likely to oppose further Western expansion. The Whigs were a party of bankers, manufacturers, small-town entrepreneurs, commercial farmers, and skilled workers. Whigs also tended to be native-born Protestants who supported evangelical religion, and the Whigs supported reform efforts, especially ones directed at non-English and Catholic immigrants. Killing the bus. Jackson would finally win the battle against the bus, which was shut down completely by 1841. Jackson received many death threats and decided that his political opponents were trying to kill him. In January of 1835, Richard Lawrence shot his pistols twice at the president. However, the guns misfired. A jury decided that Lawrence was insane and ordered him confined to an asylum. The destruction of the bus showed Jackson's strength and weaknesses. It is the determination to destroy the bus hurting the national economy. Without it, there was nothing to regulate the nation's money supply or its banks. State banks more than doubled and their dollar amount along these unregulated banks quadrupled, preparing a way for a financial panic depression. Jackson and the Democrats were committed to expansion of slavery into the Gulf Coast states in the South and the West being flooded by cotton, credit, paper money, and slaves, which produced mountains of debt. Each new state bank was irresponsible, printing in its own paper currency. This led to reckless land speculation. With no central bank to regulate these wildcat banks, many of them went bankrupt only after a few months and for years, leaving their depositors empty-handed. The Money Act. The Distribution Act. During the 1830s, the federal government acquired huge amounts of money from the sale of government-owned lands. The money received from these lands 
helped the Treasury Department to pay down the federal debt, which was eliminated completely in 1835. By 1836, the federal budget was generating an annual surplus. And in June of 1836, Congress approved the Distribution Act, which required the federal government to distribute to the states the surplus federal revenue from land sales. The state governments would then draw upon these deposits to fund roads, bridges, and other internal improvements. The Species Circular Jackson ordered the issuance of the Species Circular, which provided that after 15 August 1836, only gold, silver, or Virginia land scrip would be accepted by the government and payment for public lands. Although paper money was permitted until December 15th, for parcels of land up to 320 acres purchased by actual settlers or bona fide residents of the state in which the save was made. The purpose to repress alleged frauds from the monopoly of the public lands in the hands of speculators and capitalists and the ruinous extension of banknotes and credits. Although public land sales were reduced in the West, the circular taxed the inadequate resources of the state pet banks and drained specie from the East, which led to hoarding and the weakening of public confidence in the state banks. After Jackson defended the circular in his annual message to Congress in 1836 and recommended that land sales be limited to actual settlers, Congress passed a measure that rescinded the specie circular, but it was pocket vetoed by Jackson. The specie circular was not repealed until a joint resolution in May of 1838. Censoring the Mail the anti-slavery mailing in the 1830s movement grew among some Northerners. Groups of Northern abolitionists began mailing anti-slavery pamphlets to white Southerners in an attempt to persuade them to join their movement. These abolitionist publications angered pro-slavery Southerners, especially in Charleston, South Carolina. When Congress responded to Jackson's request for a federal censorship law to ban the mailing of these incendiary anti-slavery publications by reaffirming the right of the people to use the federal mail system, southern southern post offices began censoring the mail. The Democratic Party was split between those who affirmed the sanctity of the federal mail system and those who asserted the right of the federal government or state governments to censor mail that it deemed dangerous. The Gag Rule Congress was bombarded with petitions requesting the abolition of slavery and the slave trade in Washington, D.C. By 1836, such petitions reached a peak in crystallized sentiment among Southern congressmen that a discussion of slavery was pre prejudicial to the slave system and the comedy of the Union. The Senate adopted a satisfactory formula for disposing of the petitions by allowing presenters of the petitions to exercise their constitutional right of petition and enable the foes of anti-slavery agitators to register firm disapproval. But there were struggles in the House. The matter was complicated by Representative John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, who defended the right of petition from the beginning. Although not supporting abolitionist views, he held anti-slavery views. Adams viewed Congress as having no authority to interfere with slavery in slave states unless those states became a theater of war, at which time Congress powers did allow interference with the institution. A special house committee under Henry L. Pickney, South Carolina, recommended that the so-called gag rule, which provided that all petitions on slavery or its abolition and be tabled without being printed, and that no further action need to be taken. Congress began adopting an informal gag rule each year by which the member of Congress immediately moved to table all petitions proposing the end of slavery as soon as they were introduced. The pro-slavery members of Congress and even moderate anti-slavery moralists supported this compromise, but abolitionists soon found a powerful advocate and John Quincy Adams. The election of 1836. The Democrats nominated Martin Van Buren for president. 
the Whig coalition lacking an effective national organization, the Whigs fielded three regional presidential candidates in 1836 to hope to throw the election into the House of Representatives. There was Hugh L. White, who was chosen by anti-Jackson Democrats in Tennessee and found support in Illinois and Alabama. There was William Henry Harrison of Ohio, and Daniel Webster was nominated by the Massachusetts Legislative Caucus. The anti-Masons in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, nominated William Henry Harrison as well of Ohio for president and Francis Granger for vice president. During the campaign, Van Buren pledged to continue in the footsteps of Andrew Jackson. Although Democrats did not formally adopt a pot form, a committee address published in the Washington Globe was the equivalent to their first platform. All the other candidates represented anti-Jackson factions throughout the country. Van Buren was dubbed the Little Magician and the Red Fox of Kinderhook. The results? Van Buren got 761,559 popular votes to Harrison's 549,567. White ended up with 145,000 and Webster 41,000. Van Buren carried 15 of 26 states for 170 electoral votes, which included three disputed electors from Michigan. While Harrison received 73 electoral votes, White 26, and Webster 14. The Whigs made political inroads in the presidential election of 1836 when Van Buren lost some of the Democratic support in the South. South Carolina's 11 electors had voted for William P. Magnum of North Carolina. For the only time in U.S. history, since none of the four vice presidential candidates received a majority of the election, the vice presidential election was thrown into the Senate where Richard M. Johnson received 33 votes to 16 in February of 1837. The next sitting vice president to get elected president of the United States would be George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. Van Buren had earned the nickname the Great Magician for his magical ability to exploit his political and social connections. An economic slowdown in Great Britain in the mid-1830s prompted foreign investors to pull their gold and silver out of the American market. This, in turn, caused an economic panic in 1837. The reckless land speculation and the species circular resulted in a serious downturn in the U.S. economy, which worsened as Van Buren took office. The price of cotton fell by one-half in New Orleans. In 1836, a disastrous wheat crop came in. The effects, one-third of the nation's workforce were unemployed. Wages were cut from 30 to 50 percent. New York's unemployed demonstrated against high rents and inflated food and fuel prices, and one mob broke into the food warehouses and sacked their supplies. Several banks, beginning in New York, suspended specie payments. Public land sales fell from 20 million acres in 1836 to 3.5 million acres in 1838. The effects of the panic persisted until 1842 and 1843, particularly in the South and the West. Van Buren did not see it being the responsibility to help the American people, and Clay called him cold and heartless. But the effect of this panic was all due to Jackson's policies. In July of 1840, Congress debated an independent treasury bill to establish federal depositories independent of state banks and private businesses. In the Senate, Calhoun attached a legal tender amendment which called for a gradual reduction in the acceptance of notes of specie paying banks and payment governments due until 1841 when all payments should be made in legal tender. This was dropped before the measure had passed. The House did not pass it because of his split in the Democratic ranks, which did not occur in the Senate, out of fear of Whig nationalist tendencies. A reorganization of the 26th Congress, in which Democrats gained control of the House, when Calhoun's factions united with Democrats to pass the measure in June. An independent treasury gave the government exclusive care of its own funds, requiring progressive enforcement of the legal tender clause until all federal payments and disbursements were made in hard money after June 30, 1843. 
The act was repealed in 1841. Van Buren's administration did establish a 10-hour workday for federal employees. And in 1840, the Whigs once again nominated William Henry Harrison for the presidency, and the Dom Democrats renominated Van Buren in an attempt to make Harrison appear uninterested and unattached to the American people. The Democrats tried to paint him as a man willing to spend his days in a log cabin drinking hard cider. This plan backfired, making Harrison appear to be a man of the people, and he won the election. The people blamed Jackson and Van Buren for the cause of the Panic of 1837 and Van Buren's inability to handle the crisis. This woodcut shows William Henry Harrison luring Mother Bank, Andrew Jackson, and Van Buren into a barrel of hard cider, which was alcoholic. Interesting enough is that Harrison never drank, while Jackson and Van Buren sought to destroy the Bank of the United States. Harrison had promised to restrain it hence his providing Mother Bank a refuge in the scene. The results of the election, William Henry Harrison would end easily with 234 of the electoral votes to Martin Van Buren's only 60. Jackson's legacy. Jackson's time in office returned to the federal government the Jeffersonian approach of centralized government one of a limited national intrusion as possible. Also during his time, the number of eligible voters had tripled. Jackson's election embroidered the increased political power of the people, although it was limited to the white man's democracy. Jackson's presidency also saw the emergence of a new party system of Whigs and Democrats. And so concludes our study of the era of Jackson in Jacksonian democracy.